Hello, and welcome to Tag One Team Talks, brought to you by Tag One Consulting. With Drupal 7 rapidly approaching end of life and Drupal 9 already there, we are hearing people talk about migrating and updating more than ever before. Anyone who's ever been involved with a large scale migration, migrating a large site or application from one technology stock to another, will tell you that it's complex, time consuming, and it demands expertise. That's why we are bringing you this series of talks, diving deep into the world of Drupal migrations. And who's better to guide us than Tag One's very own Drupal migration experts? From the masterminds and maintainers of Drupal's migration tooling to the individuals behind the most groundbreaking Drupal migrations, we've got an all-star lineup who will cover everything you need to know about every aspect of migrating large-scale applications. In today's episode, we are going to talk uh, through migrating media and files. We will discuss how the media landscape changed between Drupal 7 and 10, touch on how to migrate locally stored files versus remote media, and talk about inline embedded media and much more. Let's dive in. I'm Janusz Udeltz, Strategic Growth and Innovation Manager here at Tag One and a longtime contributor to Drupal. And I'm joined today by the two well-known top contributors to Drupal, Lucas Herring, one of the five current Drupal Migrate Core Subsystem Maintainers, and Mauricio Dinarte, a Drupal Migrations Expert and author of the 31 Days of Migration series. Welcome both, and thank you for joining me. Hello. You're welcome. At the beginning, I wanted to open the discussion uh, with a little bit of background on how things changed between Drupal 7 and Drupal 10, because this is obviously something that will affect how we migrate files and media. Um, Lucas, do you want to tell us about that? Sure. So in Drupal 7, there was a thing called a file entity, and then there was a contrib module called media, that kind of nested itself on top of it. And a lot of times it worked pretty well. And if you weren't deep in the into the code or in the database, it, it just seemed like you're dealing with obviously just files, right? Except it wasn't, it was a lot of things. And that model is a bit different in Drupal 10. Uh, it got pulled into Drupal core, it uh, matured and has a different set up. The main part is that uh, we can still migrate between the two. You just have to just do it right. And there's a lot of contrib modules that will help with us. And we'll, we'll talk about those through the course of our time today. Um, and like in Drupal 10, we have this new entity type called media, but we still have the like managed file or, you know, what basically used to be file entity in Drupal 7. Yeah, file manage um, table in the database with files yeah. on the local hard drive. They are entities, but they are not fieldable in core. When you migrate, you generally need to migrate twice, quote unquote, uh, first into managed files and then into media entities to be able to use media in the media library and whatnot. But sometimes, um, people decide not to even use media entities. Um, and this is also something to consider before we start a migration. And I'm pretty sure Mauricio that uh, you have experience with that. So yeah, what, so, what are your thoughts on this decision? Um, generally speaking, it depends on whether you will leverage the functionality that in Drupal 10 you have around media. Uh, one of that would be the the media browser. If the UI uh, is compelling to you, uh, if you have needs around access controls, because you know it's an entity in itself, you can build a lot around that. Um, generally speaking, media entities are kind of the default that you will want to go into uh, to take advantage of you know the progress of Drupal itself. That being said, there are scenarios in which you might want to like not go that route, at least not, you, you, it is not a choice that you need to make for the whole site. Like you can uh, port some of the fields to media entities and other fields into regular file fields as before. So things that 
you might want to consider is if you depend for any reason on per field configuration, uh, then you might uh, you might go with regular files because at the moment, um, if you have one single uh, media type for images, for example, everything is going to go into that bucket and, uh, and however that field itself is configured, the same rules will apply uh, in terms of where files are, are located. For example, I have worked with organizations that for different reasons, they want to have a specific mm -hmm. uh, file structure, even though for from a Drupal per perspective, you know, they, they, they are just files in the file system and it is not relevant where they live, but you know, they want to keep it as they had it before. Another example was uh, a, a project that had a publication workflow and they specifically didn't want to use media library because they could expose uh, you know, files and documents that should not be seen by people uh, uploading files uh, as part of the process. Again, like there are considerations around permissions, around uh, files locations, if that is important for you. And, but generally speaking, going into media is, is the default. And as you say, uh, it's usually a two-step process. You migrate into the file entity itself, and then you migrate uh, into the media entity. And in most cases, you can even use the same source plugins uh, for that, like your, the same source. And what you will be tweaking is the destination because there will be different entities and uh, you will be tweaking the process uh, pipeline um, because you know being different entities, there will be different properties that you need to map. And one last thing about this is that if you enable validation, uh, which is generally a good idea in a migration, sometimes things are not obvious in the context of a single migration, but but if you have uh, a file migration and you don't specify that the status of, of the file is permanent, uh, that's, a, that, that's a property of the media um, entity itself, actually it's a property of the file entity itself. The file, the file migration is going to complete, validation is going to pass, but when you go to the second step of migrating media, if the file is not permanent, you will not be able to reference it. So you are going to get an error in the media migration for something that you kind of overlooked in the file migration. So just to be mindful that sometimes, especially when working with validations, you need to be mindful about configurations in dependent uh, migrations. That's a really good point. Um, I I never thought about it, but it makes total sense. Um, when you were talking about per field configuration, I I had this thought. Like I guess you could, if you have different fields in Drupal seven, and you still want to keep the distinction. You could create separate, like, and let's assume that they are all the same file type. Uh, let's say that they are all images, but some are profile images and some are like images that belong to a slideshow that belongs to an event or something like that. And semantically, you want to separate them. I guess you could have separate media types that all use the same image source plugin. And then you could even on on meet on those media types you could have different fields, and I think that there then you could also configure to to store them in a separate location. So maybe maybe that would be one one way to solving that. Um, and this was um, this was exactly the reason why we we came up with this idea of media source plugins and media types. Uh, to cover cases like this, when you have um, the same type of asset, but you want to have a different type uh, for different items of that asset. Because um, semantic, like, they might all be images, but semantically, they might not be the same thing. And one more um, comment around this is that we might be familiar with the uh, media types that are provided by the standard installation profile, you know, they, they are five out of the box, but two things. One, you are not, you know, bound to only those five. And also, uh, as it is the case with migration, sometimes you do not start with the standard installation profile. You start with minimal, for example, or even with a custom profile. 
when you do that, you don't get the, the other ones because the five ones that come with core actually are part of configuration that only get installed with the standard installation profile. So if you're using something else as your, as your base, as your starting point for a migration uh, to Drupal 10, you might either have to recreate them manually or copy the same configuration that comes with the standard installation profile. Just want to highlight that because one of the very first time that I noticed that um, those configurations actually from, from the profile and not from a module, it was kind of puzzling why it was not there. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. And just to mention here, the source plugins that we have available in core, uh, we have file, like a generic file image, um, audio file, and a video file. And here with video file, we're not talking about things that are remote embeddable, like YouTube or Vimeo or something like that, but like a literal video file, dot like web, uh, webm or mp4. Um, and additional to that, and we will talk about the remote media in the next section. Additional to that, it also provides an O embed, which covers like majority of remote use cases. Um, but then if uh, if we need something specific, there are also uh, contrib contributed modules that provide more source plugins. But as core evolved, I think that it's safe to say that nowadays, um, we can we can cover a lot just by using functionality provided in core. Um, Lucas, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we touched on media module in D seven before, um, but how would the fact that the Drupal seven site uses media module compared to like only what was in Drupal seven core? How how does that affect migration? In some ways, it's a little bit easier because you've already got two media, two entities between Drupal seven and Drupal seven to migrate. Uh, you've got the media entity, and you've got the file entity, which is kind of what you already have in Drupal ten too. Uh, and so it makes it a little easier to to be able to to link the two together and then pull them over into your new site. The uh, the sources of these of the data, the source of the data is is a SQL query. The, you have to look in different tables, different places in the database, and there's uh, source you know, source plugins that pull together both of those things. So one for for the media, and one for the files, and and then allows you to map them to the new destinations in Drupal ten. Yeah, and I guess media media in D seven um, handled remote media, also handled uh, CK editor embeds, um, and during our migration, we will potentially need to cover all of those. Um, but I guess we will we will talk about those later on uh, when we get there. Um, are there any contributed modules that uh, can help us approach migration? of uh, media from Drupal 7 into Drupal 10? Um, I have worked with at least three different ones. Uh, media migration is probably the most complete or the one that is trying to achieve more. Uh, for one, it will try to automatically convert uh, what you had in Drupal 7 to media entities in Drupal 10. And when I say what you had in Drupal 7, if you were not using like media in Drupal 7, it will still convert regular file fields into, you know, it will build a connection so that they are media entities. And if you were using media entities before, it would, it would just like copy the configuration uh, automatically and move over the data. It will also take care of things within the wishy, which as you said before, uh, if you had embeds, if you have even uh, uh, links, to other entities, it will try to detect them and just like make the connections automatically. Under the hood, that module depends on another module that is called Migrate Mag Magician. And that is for a very good reason because this module is very powerful. It is almost like magic to like everything that it does. That being said, 
if uh, the, the approach that the module takes is more or less what Drupal core does. Like it is going to try to make a one to one copy of the content model to what you had before. And if, you know, for different reasons, like you have a new content model, a new site structure, you need to make some changes to how the entities are like uh, configured. Uh, like you might, you might have to, to go a custom route. And in that case, what we normally do is install the module, do not use it for the automatic migration of configuration, but instead just use the process plugins that are provided so that in my custom migration, uh, I am able to you know, do these transformations like the embeds in the WYSIWYG, but uh, adapted to my new content model that is you know, being migrated into uh, with, the, with the custom migrations. So that's probably like the, the one that you might look first. And the second one that I have also used is Migrate Media Handler. Uh, this is uh, narrower in scope, but um, I, I, I will share a story later in another section, but just to point out that it is there. And I actually use it for another project that was uh, migrating content from a WordPress site. So the process plugins provided by that module actually helped me um, migrate from WordPress to Drupal in a different context. And the last one is uh, Migrate Plus itself. It has um, process plugins to manipulate the DOM. So depending on you know what type of changes you need to do to uh, to, to reach text fields, uh, you you could use it to also like manipulate embeds of media within the within the body or rich text fields in general. Great. Um, another thing that I have experience with is uh, handling large libraries and please correct me if i'm wrong but i think that uh generally migrate when you're migrating files it will check if a file exists on the expected destination and if it doesn't it will try to copy it from the source to where it should be um and if you have a large library um that could take quite a long time. So it's much better if you can to mount your files into the correct place. So it's already so they are already there. And um, if that's not possible, uh, rather rsync it before running the migration than than copying through the migration because that would that will slow it down significantly. Um, it's not the fault. It's not but default. It so, is a flag that you can alter and change. It's the file copy plugin. And okay. there's a file exists flag to the plugin. And you just say use existing and we'll start using the existing files if it finds a file there already. Yeah. So it is important. Yeah. You, you mentioned like the strategy that you mentioned is actually very helpful because it's going to speed up the process. Uh, of the migration, if you don't copy over the files first, you will have to like fetch them basically. And bringing over the files is going to take usually a long time, especially for big libraries. So probably the best approach is to copy the files manually via rsync or some other way. Uh, and then what uh, Lucas just said, like in the file copy plugin, add the configuration for use the existing files. If not, the default is that if the file exists, it is going to uh, rename it, I think. So uh, just like make a copy with uh, an appendix, uh, like underscore zero, underscore one, underscore two. So you need to use that, uh, that thing. Another thing that I want to point out is that um, it is common in a migration uh, to be important and rolling back the migrations because you are testing things, you, you are polishing along the way. With the files migration in particular, if what well, once you have the entities in your file system of the new site, whether that was because you manually copy them or because it was done as part of the migration itself, one important part of the file migration is that if you roll it back, uh, ultimately the migrate API works with other APIs in Drupal, and in particular with the entity API. Rolling back uh, an entity means uh, deleting the entity. 
And the file entity, not only deletes the record from the database, it also deletes the file from the file system. So if you already copied, you know, 10 gigabytes of data and you rolled that migration, you rolled back the migration, uh, you're going to lose all the files. So be mindful about that. There is something that I usually do, but I don't tell anyone until now is that you can hack or delete the one line that actually removes the, the file system operation. And then your files will be still there the next time that you migrate in again. But you know, in, in these sessions, we are giving good advice and sometimes not so wise advice. So don't... that's not actually a bad advice. No, I, I hack yes. for a lot on my local machine. To, and to thank get, you for sharing your that. secret. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. another one more bad advice that I can provide is that if for whatever reason you're just test testing locally, like in, in the destination, like production, real migration, what we just said before about mounting the files or arsing the files, that is the best approach. But if you are just working locally and want to speed up the process, another trick that I do is that in the file migration, I do not use the file copy plugin. I just literally map the URI from the source to the destination. And then I use a staged file proxy to only fetch files as needed. Again, like you need to be mindful about these things because in the final migration, you need to do it properly. But again, like when, when you just like want to speed things up because you know 10 gigabytes of downloads is going to slow you down in general, um, that's another thing that I do, but I usually don't talk about. <laughs> and that's why we have these team talks to share little dirty tricks that we use. Um, are there any special considerations with private files when migrating private files or it's just business as usual? Uh, no, I mean, they're private for a reason. So you're not going to be able to get access to them. But you still want to move them over, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, just like Mauricio said, with the not actually doing the file copy, you'd want to do that here, and you'd want to move those files using rsync. Either that, or you create a secure dev environment with a firewall or something, and take off the private for a few minutes while you copy things over. Like, there are ways around it. I have heard of people doing it, but give yourself a break. Rsync the files over, otherwise it's death by a thousand paper cuts. And there's really no good way to know that they actually got over there. I mean, HTTP is a terrible way to sync things. If you try to do a, a request using HTTP, which is what happens when we're doing the file copy, mm, one out of a thousand requests will fail. But Rsync has built into it, into its protocols, a lot of protections to make sure that the things on left and right, destination and source are exactly the same. And after you've run it once, if you run it a second time, it's just gonna pick up the differences. Uh, so don't don't try to do it other ways. I don't, I don't know of any large file migration that someone hasn't you know, used rsync. Um, there's even like, if you're using Pantheon, Pantheon has an rsync terminus plugin to make this really easy. Um, just, yeah, make yourself, make your life a lot easier and, and, and do it the right way. Um, I have another anecdote related to rsync, but I will, I will save that to the end, to the anecdote section. Um, let's, let's talk about remote media and just to define what we mean by remote media here. Uh, we're talking about things that are on the internet and we want to use on our websites, but are in the context of our website are not files. Like things like YouTube videos, um, Flickr images, Instagram photos, um, TED Talks, uh, Vimeo videos, in general, all embeds, and you could have like slide share slide or something like that. Um, Again, in Drupal 7, media stored uses managed files. Um, in Drupal 10, we don't do that anymore and store them as media entities using uh, the correct source plugins. Um, so I guess it's not very different, but, but how is migration of this kind of media different than migrating 
local to the side files. In um, some ways, it's identical. It really is. However, because it's a new type of thing, a lot of times you get more requests on, can we filter out certain ones of them? Can we divide them? Can we chunk them up? Or, hey, we've got, for various reasons, these iframes directly embedded in CK Editor. And, our, and so we need to extract them and use this new media thing, new media entity, and, and create a media entity for it, and then replace that with a, a media embed right in the CK editor. And so those are the types of things that come up with remote media that wouldn't come up with local files. And using all the same modules that we've already talked about, the media migration module has a, a really great tool for converting uh, some of those things in the CK editor uh, body field. However, Migrate Plus, as, as Mauricio hit on, has some DOM manipulator utilities. And when you're dealing with iframes, you can then do uh, queries, direct uh, DOM queries using uh, like real X query style requests. You're not even doing regex then. You're doing uh, manipulation. And so you find the iframes that have the YouTube videos, and then you can create the media entity, insert it in the, the destination site, uh, go uh, create the embed code and drop it and replace that in, in the, the body field as you're migrating over. And that's the power of, of of using all of these different things. It's not the, you know, like you're, that's going to be custom. You're going to have to, to, to talk, talk through what, what's actually needed, what's actually wanted, but it's totally possible. And it's actually not all that complicated to do and makes the, the customer so much more happy when everything's converted over to media. Um, one small tip on performance when dealing with uh, like remote uh, media. It, by default, um, Drupal is going to try to generate a thumbnail for every media that gets created on Entity Save. Again, like the Merit API is just interacting with other uh, APIs of Drupal itself, and in this case, the Entity API. So um, if you have a large migration, whether it uses remote media or not, you can disable the generation of thumbnails and like defer that to a later stage that can happen on cron point being it, that that generation doesn't happen during the migration and it's specifically important for remote medias because you will be pinging an external service to get the thumbnail itself like if you are getting videos from youtube you're not only getting the reference to the to the youtube videos like the link itself you will also ping their servers to to get the, the thumbnail so that is something that you can disable. It will not affect the migration. You just like uh, defer that to a later stage, which can happen on cron. That brings up a, a remembrance with the local files too. So local files, if you say, ah, we don't need to pull over the file sizes or, um, well, see, this was the issue. This is why I remember it. We were pulling over the files, the file sizes just because that's what we dutifully did, except uh, Drupal, Drupal's entity API for files was ignoring the fact that, that, that the file sizes were already provided to it during the migration. And it was going out and rechecking the size of the file, which is not so bad if the files are local, but if they you know, are on S3, on a, re a slow remote S3 instance, uh, it can be, really painful after moving over a, a large file to then wait another two or three seconds for it to do the the calculation of sizes. So now that's fixed, but you still have to make sure that you pass the file sizes over. Otherwise it's still going to uh, try to figure out what the size of the file is and store that in the database. All those small details. Yes, all yeah. of the details. 
as you said, dead by a thousand paper cuts. <laughs> Painful and slow. Um, do we want to briefly talk what is currently provided in terms of remote media, what is provided by core and in which situations we might need to uh, rely on contract for? Um, YouTube and video are supported out of the box. Um, in general, Drupal supports OEmbed, uh, but if you want something other than YouTube and video, and Vimeo, and that provider gives you the option to fetch from OEmbed, uh, you can enable more. And there are uh, other modules, uh, one is called Video Embed Field, that will give you like a very long list of more providers that you can pick from. Yes, exactly. And 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 if you are not working with videos, if we are working with something else, there is usually a module that provides the integration for media entity. Um, even for things like I, I know I, I'm not sure if the module still exists, but you know, I remember seeing a module for like Google Drive documents. And then you could have documents in Google Drive and use that. Um what about the inline or embedded media in CK Editor? We we touched on that in the past, uh, but how how that affects migration? Um, as far as I know, like the the embed tag is definitely different. Um, so we need to handle that. Uh, what what else might we consider while doing that? the the media migration module um actually supports two type of embeds uh, and it, there is a configuration that you can uh, you can toggle but again like media migration is trying to automatically convert all of those as needed um if you are not doing like a one to one migration uh you can still use the module without using their source plugins for generating that configuration and in particular, there is a media wish week filter that it's a process plugin that is going to um, just like, again, do its magic to detect when there is a media embed and look for the corresponding media entity and make the proper uh, you know, embed code into the into the body field, into the wish week. Um, another option, and this is where the story about the WordPress migrations comes along. Um, for this project, we were, it was a, a Drupal project already. It was a Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 upgrade at, at that point. Um, but they also wanted to consolidate other properties that they had, and some of those were in WordPress. So we were migrating WordPress posts and their associated images and files. Uh, what we did was install a, a plugin in the WordPress sites to be, to be able to export the configuration Similar to the token system that we have in, in Drupal, WordPress uses something that is that are called shortcodes, uh, you know, like token-like strings, and that is how it is stored in the database. So yeah, the the plugin allows us to run a a function in WordPress. They are called filters, and it's called do shortcut. Basically, transform the tokens into HTML, and from there we generated CSV files that we migrated into. Drupal, and in this case, we were actually using uh, the media ma media migrate handler module uh, because it it provided very good reference process plugins. So again, like it, I really recommend also looking at that one, uh, especially when you are migrating from other things outside of Drupal. Great. Um... Lucas, maybe we can briefly talk about the architecture of embedding in D10 because it's different than D7. Because in D7, media module that, that did everything. What do you have in Drupal 10? I know this is not strictly migration related, but it's still useful knowledge for the context. There's kind of two things. There's media em embedding that has been around with media module in Drupal 7. 
that that's still a thing in Drupal, and that's kind of in in core even. But then there's entity embed, and and that was not part of media in Drupal seven, and you could still do it. You still want to install that module now, uh, the embed module is what it's called in Drupal 10 to be able to do this entity embed functionality. The module just within the last two or three months got Drupal 10 support. Uh, so you're, you're good to go there uh, to go straight to Drupal 10. Uh, the code, the short code or like the, the token that is embedded is a slightly different uh, for, for entities versus media. Uh, there's a lot of similarities. Um, you just got to get the right, right short code to, to get inserted into your, your CK editor for it to then go out and find the right thing to load and embed with the right view mode and all the other options that would get passed along to the thing that you're embedding. Yeah, and this basically allows us to not like, um, you, you obviously can embed media, but then since it can embed any entity, you can embed views, for example. So if you want your view embedded in WYSIWYG for whatever reason, um, there is a sub module for embed that, that can do that. Um, yeah. And I believe that it even provides like a nice button for CK editor for you to be able it to- It does, yeah. Uh, entity embed is where I've mostly used it. And uh, that's that's really useful with the migration. So the interesting views, views don't work so well unless you're calling the view between the old site and the new site the same exact name. And nothing has changed in that view, which is a big if. But entities, entities, you can find that, you know, it was no, called node one, two, three on the old site. And now it's called maybe node two, three, four on the new site. And let's just connect the, the dots here and replace it with the right uh, embed code. Great. And then if we are using cloud storage providers like S3, um, are there any special considerations in that case or how, how would that usually work? Well, you have to, it depends on the provider. If you're dealing with S3 itself from Amazon, then you want to minimize data transfers if you're on a budget. Uh, if you're not on a, a strict budget, then maybe you don't care. Uh, but you can clone buckets very easily. So you can have bucket one and bucket two. And so your migration can be as simple as cloning the bucket. Um, I, I guess I would recommend cloning, at least during initial development, because those nasty developers <laughs> tend to try to create and delete things while they're doing things. And what happens if they run a re revert of the file migration and now all of a sudden the S3 bucket is empty and where did all of the files go on the live site? Oops, don't want Oops. that to happen. So clone it and you do yourself a favor. Never happened before, right? It has not thankfully happened to me. <laughs> not exactly that. Although close enough that I've had scares. So clone it. Um, so th that's if you're dealing with S3. Now, if you're dealing with uh, another provider, Backblaze, or uh, I th I'm even Cloudflare now has a new object storage. And uh, what is the other one? Um, DigitalOcean has one. And a lot of folks are introducing these things, and they're fairly economical. Uh, use them. Totally use them. And in fact, you might even want to go from local storage to S3. But if you're doing that, uh, I recommend getting the files local, probably use rsync to sync them local to your local disk, and then use S3 command to push them up to DigitalOcean if that's where you, you've landed, or S3 itself, right? And then use S3 command to sync them up to the cloud. It's going to be so much faster. S3 command uh, doesn't, there's no API to do synchronous HTTP. 
uh, directly to S3 because S3 itself doesn't quite support it. But but it's kind of multi-threaded. So it'll do up to like eight file uploads all at the same time with S3 command. So you're 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 gonna be a lot, lot faster if you're dealing with 100 gigabytes of data or 200 gigabytes of data. Uh, and your pocketbook will be a whole lot better uh, the next month once you've rolled over to S3 because uh, your S3 compatible storage is going to be way more ch um, cheap than local storage. Now, uh, I say that, and there's always exceptions, but every time I've ever entered that conversation, it's way cheaper to do S3 than local storage. Yeah, that's my experience as well. The fact is, like, I've been involved with a project where they decided to go with S3 uh, to save on hosting costs. Yeah. The, the number of files grew and their hosting bills started to grow because of the the size of, of, of which, the file storage there. And then they switched to which, S3 for that reason. That brings to mind um, another two things about S3. One, uh, in Drupal 7, there was a, a module called with the word migrate in it for S3. It was like a separate module uh, called, what is it called? S3 FS migrate. It's not a migrate in the, the module in the, the general sense. It just was a, a bad, bad overly used name to move the files from, from local to S3. That's now part of S3 FS itself. And it's st still even in S3 FS, not really migrate in the, the sense that Drupal migrate, uh, but it still lets you move things from local to, to S3. That's one thing. The other thing uh, around S3 is there's an S3 FS cores module. This is just a free suggestion but uh, if you're dealing with large files, like over maybe 100 megabytes or so, and you're going to be pushing them up to S3, the S3FS cores module, uh, again, not related to migrate, but you know, free tip, will let you, uh, rather than uploading directly to Drupal, and then Drupal turning around and forwarding it over to S3. So now we've got timeouts for PHP. Uh, of 60 seconds or 30 seconds and uh, max post size and all these wonderful things. Maybe you're hosted on Pantheon and it blocks a file that's over hundred. You know, all these things, S3FS cores will let you post directly to S3 bucket. And so then all of those, it has, it, I think S3 um, providers have limits on how long it'll take to upload the file, but they're like an hour and Two, two terabytes of, of for the site, you know, like orders of magnitude massively bigger. So use use that module, um, not for migrate, but just for using S3. Great, thank you. Um, and let's let's quickly discuss uh, migrating media from remote sources. And here we're we're not talking about like things like YouTube videos and you know embeddable things but actually file assets that we get from remote sources, usually through HTTP requests. Um, and my great API will generally copy those over. Um, but as we discussed, this can cause migrations to run very slowly. And I guess, are there any other problems that we might experience? Uh, in what cases would we resort to doing that what's your experience there well anytime you're dealing with files you can run into issues but if it's a drupal site the drupal site tends to have certain requirements that we're more familiar with we're used to the fact that it's running a certain version of php and apache or nginx and and those things are usually more up to date. But if you're dealing with an external website, I've dealt with some really odd things where 
two uh, two days later, we finally figured out it was an SSL cert issue, and it was only when we ran the migration on Acquia, which had one version of OpenSSL, and the remote site that we're pulling from had another version of OpenSSL, that the certs were not working the way that we were expected, and the files were randomly not getting pulled over. They were kind of a bit secure, so there was even sort of a uh, you know, IP address level security where we would only allow migrations from Acquia. It wasn't private, but it was the equivalent of private in that 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 system. And oh, you know, you just the, the things that you can dig up when you're dealing with pulling files from a remote location. If it can happen, it will happen. And you'll have the joy of figuring out. So just to R-sync the stuff. I mean, that solves nine out of 10 problems. 99 out of 10, 100 problems to R-sync the files. When we talk about files and remote files, it's not only like you know documents or images, it's like remote sources. So something that I have seen is that you know, we are embedding this slideshow document from this third party service, and that was an iframe before. Um, what, like, again, like if your provider uses OEMBED, you can replace type iframe by, you know, copying the OEMBED link, processing that, parsing that, and just use that as a media entity. It will be more secure and um, easier to manage in, in the long run. Uh, just like an iframe in, in, in your bridge text field is generally a, a bad idea. Uh, something else that, again, like I guess at this point, I'm going to take the, uh, just like multiple interpretations of remote files because Drupal itself can have, you know, remote files uh, in, and specifically I'm talking about files that are not in the files managed table. I have seen projects that they use ICME or some other like even FTP direct uploads to to the server and it is a Drupal site. Uh, if you go to the domain of the Drupal site, they will be served because it's part of the you know they are in the in the same server, but they are not known to Drupal. They just have an interface uh, to like link to them. But if you do a file migration, they will never be detected. So that's another one that's kind of tricky, like having to like searching like basically the, the file system for things that are not uh, managed by Drupal itself. And again, like speaking about communication with between one environment and another, something that I have seen uh, when working locally, uh, uh, specifically with DDEP, and this is not exclusive to DDEP, but it's just like the tool that uh, I use the most often, um, if you are trying to migrate files between one instance of DDEP and the other one, by default, uh, you will have to take some extra steps to set up the local SSL certificates. If you don't do that, uh, you can you know go around it by like providing you know HTTP instead of HTTPS, uh, and if it's a local environment, it might not be a big deal. But again, like uh, just things that happen during development. And depending on what type of project you're working on, you are going to be dealing with this kind of thing. So be mindful of certificates, be mindful of locations, be mindful of files that might have been in the server, but not managed by Drupal, or just like remote resources that were iframes before, and you might convert those to media entities. Great, thank you. And for the end, I uh, thought that we could share an interesting, experiences from the past that we've seen during migrations. Uh, Lucas, do you have any? Uh, I mean, I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of them aren't around files because you can avoid a lot of the issues by our syncing. I we can't say enough for, for that. Um, but if you do do a file migration, there is still after like probably eight years, uh, an open issue in drupal.org for a memory leak and with, during a migration. It's just generally about memory leak and migrate uh, during a migration, but 
about every six months, someone will find that issue and post on it and say, hey, I'm having this too. And, and here's the workaround I did. And, and I'll, I'll talk about some workarounds. But it's always to do with files. It's always to do with files that they have this this memory leak where they they're running their drush command and now it's like up to three terabytes or two ter two two gigabytes of memory or something you know like massive quantities of memory and then the migration dies and it's usually during the file migration. So what are some workarounds there? Uh, there's a batch mode uh, that you can pass to your source plugins. It's all of these migrations. Um, for the most part, have well, they all have a source plugin. They're, it's built into that. I th there's a couple other sessions we have, Yana, isn't there around um, ETL and extra X transform mm -hmm. load, right? Yeah. So I'll I'll let you go to that that session to hear more about it. But the source plugin is uh, for Drupal nine times out of ten a SQL query, and uh, SQL you can pass a a limit on the SQL query. And so for the file migration, do that. That'll help you. Um, the, the next thing is uh, rather than if you're using a drush migration, drush migrate import, and then here's the name of the thing I want to import, do it on a per migration name. Don't use like tags or group or anything and say migrate all the things all at once. Uh, again, there's a, a an issue with memory management, either in Drush or Drupal Core or somewhere, uh, where after a few hundred of these things, it runs out of memory. Um, if you break them up into migrate the basic page migration, migrate the files migration, migrate the users migration, and individually migrate each individual thing, you're going to be a whole lot happier with memory management. Um, and then. Oh, sorry. Oh, one more last thing. Uh, you spent all this time and you want to get a pristine report. There was 100 files on the old site and only 99 got moved over, according to, to the report from, from Drush Migrate or whatever. You're always going to have missing files because these were files that were stored on the hard drive. I don't think I've run into a migration yet where one or two or dozens of files got removed at some random point in the past. So don't be shocked if you're going to see 404s uh, or missing files. That's just a matter of garbage in, garbage out, and someone deleted a file because it was too big, or maybe the file got corrupted. Uh, you had an incident. Or, I, some, for some reason, there's always in, uh, missing files, always. Well, I have shared some of the stories already, but the one that Lucas just um, talked about reminded me of one case in which, uh, like, out of memory errors, um, lead together with another configuration option that you can have for your source plugin, which is the high watermark. So in this context, um, the high watermarks allows you to basically that translates to uh, aware statements in, in, the, in the query that says, I only want to migrate anything above this value. The problem in this case was that um, the high watermark as of today, and there is an issue for this, um, is set up very early in the process uh, when, when you're processing the row. And because of the out of memory error, um, you know, the, the the high watermark has already been saved in the database as if the row were was uh, processed correctly, but it failed because of the memory error. And then the next time that you run, uh, it, it it just like it skips one value. And the problem is that it is not only skips one value. Another thing that happens is for one, uh, it's kind of not intuitive to debug what's going on, but also you end up. Uh, finding out that at the end of that migration, you are missing one file that, isn't, that hasn't been processed. And as it is a good idea to have uh, migration dependencies in place, then any other migration that depends on files is going to be blocked because you are one file short of, in your file migration. So you need to, like in this case, like it was some debugging, 
to figure out what was going on, what was the cause, and then reset the high watermark value to, to be able to migrate that missing file. But like it's like many little things working together. And as I said before, sometimes the result of one migration can affect another one. And this was one of those scenarios, like a uh, high watermark combined with the memory leak made uh, made this file migration miss one record. And then, you know, notes and everything else that depend on it, um, you, you know, didn't meet the requirements because of that file that was missing. Interesting. All the dirty details, always <laughs> hard to debug. Um, we almost like we mentioned that you should are seeing files so many times during this episode. It's almost like the main message that that we <laughs> seem to want to have to deliver. And um, my anecdote from the past is related to that uh, to to air syncing the files. Um, and it's um, it was not a migration. It's from the the times when I worked at examiner.com, which was the largest Drupal website on the internet at the time. Um, it was a D7 site, uh, but this was after a few years after the migration to Drupal 7 happened. Um, but we were switching data centers because uh, we, we we had our own hardware, but we, we switched the data center provider. And um, the infrastructure team decided that because we had so huge files library on that side, they decided that they don't want to rsync it from one data center to another. And they opted in to send hard drives over mail to the other data center because they apparently they thought it would be faster and easier. So oh, even rsync doesn't solve every problem. I found it hilarious, like that it's it's it was actually easier to do it over snail mail with hard drives than well, you probably still used rsync though. You probably used rsync to catch up. Yeah, just to, just to catch up for sure. But yeah, the, so there are rsync. Yeah, rsync is there. <laughs> okay, this this brings us to the end of of this episode. Um we have uh, some great talks coming up still. Our goal is to put one out uh, per week uh, over the next few months to support the community in the migration process. Um, performance, we touched on performance today, and it's something that we care deeply about at Tag1. Um, and as we've seen, it applies to migrations as well. Uh, when you're handling large data sets, uh, migration can take hours or even days, um, and we'll do talks specifically about performance of migrations. Um, every project owner wants their migration to be a success. So we will dedicate an episode to discuss the most important factors for a successful Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 migration in order to help you successfully navigate your migration project. And other talks that we are planning to do include topics like porting custom code from Drupal 7 to 10, the future of the migrate tooling, how to port the team, and so much more. So we hope that you'll tune in and enjoy our upcoming team talks. At this point, I would also like to mention uh, the upcoming upgrading from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 series of blog posts by Mauricio, which was inspired by the 31 days of migration series that Mauricio did in the past. So Mauricio, can you tell us a bit more about the new upcoming series. Sure, um, this will be coming up, uh, coming out early in 2024, and it can be summarized as an opinionated guide uh, for migrating a Drupal set from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10. It contains a lot of the you know, lessons that I have learned over the years, and similar to the original series, 31 days of migrations, it is going to be packed with examples. It is actually like a real project that we will be migrating together. Um, both content and configuration will be migrated, but more important than the technical part is also like giving advice, like before writing the first migration, before executing the first command, we're going to discuss things like understanding, you know, the tool that you're going to use, the migrate API, because it is probably the most popular one, but by no means the only one. So we're going to 
uh, explain how it works, what are some of the assumptions, what are some of the limitations. We are going to give recommendations about auditing your Drupal 7 site and making considerations when moving to Drupal 10. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing it with the community. We are all looking forward to it. So uh, yeah, stay tuned. It will be published on Agwan's website. All the links that we mentioned today will be posted online with the talk. Uh, if you like this talk, please remember to upvote, subscribe, and share it. Check our past talks at tagone.com slash TTT. That's three T's for Tag One Team Talks. As always, we'd love your feedback and topic suggestions. Write us at TTT at tagone.com. Big thanks to our two guests today and to everyone who tuned in. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.